chapter 3 verse 2 is the main scripture text the verse reads and all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman for the king had so commanded concerning him but Mordecai bowed not nor did him reverence it's Esther 3 chapter chapter 3 verse 2 the confessional reading is the Westminster confessional of Faith, chapter 1, article 3. That's our confessional reading. The books commonly called Apocrypha, not being a divine inspiration, are no part of the canon of Scripture, and therefore are of no authority in the Church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. The Westminster Confession of Faith, Chapter 1, Article 3. Now the sermon. The introduction. The issue of authority is an important issue. Who has the lawful authority to command us what to believe and what to practice? As Christians, we proclaim that the 66 books of the Bible alone are God's Word revealed to man. The Bible alone is the Word of God. Only these books have the proper authority to command us what to believe and what to practice. This is Sola Scriptura. Any human authority that exists here on earth was established by God. So any government that we have operating today was established by God. The Bible teaches this when it says, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. John chapter 19, verses 10 through 11. The authority of human government, it did not spring into existence apart from God. The Bible says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise, praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Romans 13, verses 1 through 6. It is the job of human government to punish crime and to protect the innocent. The human government is to be respected and obeyed. For the Bible says, Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Romans chapter 13, verse 7. However, 
No government here on earth has the authority to command us to violate one of God's commandments. No government here on earth has the authority to prevent us from reading the Bible and worshiping our God. We must remember that governments like people can also act in a wicked manner. When any government commands us to perform wicked acts, ungodly deeds, then we are to resist. When any government forbids us from reading our Bibles or worshiping the God of the Bible, then we are to disregard that government at that very point. The Bible properly limits all human government when it states the following, We ought to obey God rather than men. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Here in the book of Esther, we have an outstanding example of one of God's people refusing to obey a wicked command issued by the Persian government. We are met with an example of a man who refuses to disobey the God of the Bible in order to satisfy the pride of a wicked government. We have a man standing up against the world's most powerful nation in the name of God, based on Scripture alone. What can one man do? You will hear people today protest saying, But I am one man. What can I do? The book of Esther shows us what one man can do. Especially one man convinced that the Bible alone is the Word of God. He can take on an empire. He can take on an entire nation. And he can win. For the Bible says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Again the Bible says, If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8. Verse 31. Part 1. The Bible says, After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advance him, and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Esther chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Here we have a man named Haman, who has been promoted above the princes and given a chief seat next to the king. It's the king's right-hand man. Ahasuerus was so impressed with Haman that he commanded all to bow down to Haman, to prostrate themselves before Haman. In Persia, the act of bowing to a king was an act of worship. This was an immediate problem for anyone living in Persia who happened to believe the Bible. For Scripture strictly forbids us to worship anything other than God. So when King Ahasuerus commanded that all bow and worship to Haman, then it is easy to see why Mordecai would refuse to obey. We have to be careful. For sinful man has a tendency to worship things other than God. Hebrews, however, were not the only individuals in history to refuse to worship the Persian kings by bowing to them. They weren't the only ones. The Greeks also have a history of this. For example, even after Alexander the Great had conquered the Persian Empire, most of the Greeks were outraged when he demanded himself to be worshipped as a god. Alexander decided to take on his practice and have himself worshipped as a god. We're talking about Alexander the Third, Alexander the Great. Alexander's officers did not want to bow to him. The Persian act of prostrating oneself to a monarch 
was called prokinesis. That's what the Greeks called it. And it met with immediate resistance from Alexander's Macedonian commanders. It caused a lot of trouble when he did that. So you, the Greeks, who were pagans, understood that part of the law written on their hearts, enough at least, that they didn't want to bow to a mere man. They considered all men, especially amongst the Greeks, the Greeks at least, not the barbarians, to be equal. They wouldn't bow to them. But Alexander the Great was himself. <clears throat> Alexander the Great was himself a type of Antichrist. He was a type of it. He adopted the Babylonian religion and combined government and religion together. He placed himself at the apex. The Caesars of Rome in the Roman Empire would eventually follow Alexander's lead. Octavian, also known as Augustus, which means the revered one, assumed the title Pontifex Maximus, which means the supreme high priest. He also assumed the title of Pater Patriae, which means father of the fatherland. The Pope would also adopt these same titles, proving himself to be Antichrist. When it's all said and done, when you go back and you look at the similarities and how one religion moves to another, when it's all said and done, today's Roman Catholicism is simply the same old Babylonian religion found in the Old Testament. The entire history of Antichrist developing throughout the text of the Bible and history alongside the kingdom of God. Here in our United States, we are witnessing a rising love affair with kings, with royalty, and with aristocracy. As our nation becomes more Catholic, the people desire to have an aristocratic government. And this government, they wish to take the place of the Constitutional Republic. Our presidents now travel to the Vatican to meet secretly with the Pope. Such a thing was unheard of less than even ten years ago. You never would have heard of anything like that. A president going to meet with the Pope at the Vatican secretly. No way. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me uh, that the power of the presidency is increasing. Just consider the practice of executive orders. While the other two branches of our government seem to be fading away into the background, as our First Amendment continues to be erased, we will see the merging of church and state and the end of religious freedom, the right to assemble, the right to a free press, the right to speak freely. Here in the United States, we will soon see instances like we see here in the third chapter of the book of Esther. Mordecai's refusal to bow to Haman was an act of free speech. It was an act of religious freedom and expression and it was against the law of the Persian Empire. They didn't have freedom of speech in the Persian Empire. They didn't have freedom of religion. Despite the commands of the king of Persia, Mordecai obeyed God rather than men. Mordecai practiced his religion faithfully and publicly. Who will you obey, beloved, should you find yourself in a similar situation in the near future? Will you obey God or will you obey man? You may go to prison if you obey the Bible. You may be killed. It's a good question. One that may be coming up in the near future. Part 2. The Bible says, Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgress thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him and he hearkened not unto them that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matter would stand for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not nor did him reverence then was Haman full of wrath. Esther chapter 3 verses 3 through 5. That Mordecai's refusal to bow before Haman was a public act of free speech and religious expression is verified in these verses. 
For the king's servants not only saw Mordecai's refusal, but they demand a reason for his behavior. They want to know why he's doing this. Why is he acting this way publicly? This adds pressure to Mordecai. For his co-workers are trying to influence him to obey what they used to call peer pressure. I don't know if they still call it that or not. But he would not budge. The other servants talked daily with Mordecai, urging him to obey the command, but he would not budge. These old Calvinists can be stubborn. Mordecai explained to the servants that he was a Jew and that he was forbidden by God's law to worship a mere man. Mordecai did not hide his candle under a bushel. But he set it upon a candlestick, and it gave its light unto all that were in the house. Friends, listen. Jesus says, Ye are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. The servants of the king ran and told Haman that Mordecai refused to bow to him and give him reverence. The servants of the king wanted to see if Mordecai would get away with this. And when the proud Haman saw for himself that Mordecai did not bow to him, then Haman was enraged, full of wrath. Look at how these tyrants act, enraged and full of wrath. Consider that for a moment. This is a warning for any nation to take steps to prevent men from becoming tyrants. All tyrants seek to sit on the very throne of God. They love to be worshipped. That, that is why the huge pictures of them that we see put up in nations where they have dictators and tyrants. You see these huge pictures put on walls and out in the public. They want to be worshipped as God. Tyrants are men who despise the Bible. The two things are logically incompatible. Tyranny and the teaching of Scripture doesn't go hand in hand. When some refuse a tyrant worship, well, then the hatred of the tyrant is kindled and it's unleashed. Part 3. The Bible says, And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had shown him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. In the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is the lot before Haman, from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar. And Haman said unto king Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people of all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all the people. Neither keep they the king's law. Therefore it is not to the king's profit to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee. The people also, to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month. There was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over the every province and of the rulers of every people of every province according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language. In the name of the king Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both old, little children, and women, 
In one day, even upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Esther chapter 3, verses 6 through 13. Haman's wrath was not limited to Mordecai. God was planning a great work for his people. So he had the king's servants to show Haman that Mordecai was only one of many Jews who all held these beliefs. Haman projected his rage upon all the Jews. Haman would not be satisfied with simply killing one Hebrew, but he would wipe them all out. He would seek to murder man, woman, and child. There was no limit to this man's bloodlust. Even so, God would not be satisfied in saving just one of his own. Jehovah would not be satisfied in simply saving Mordecai. But God would save all of his people from the evil plans of Haman. When would Haman seek to execute this mass murder and genocide? Well, tyrants have a tendency to be superstitious. It's a plain fact. Tyrants tend to be superstitious. Haman is an example of this. He would superstitiously trust in the casting of lots to determine the best day for the massacre. But this would only work to the advantage of the Hebrew people, beloved. For the casting of lots, in this text here, it set the date of execution to be about a year away. They had a whole year before this was going to take place because he chose to cast lots. Our sovereign God had not only set the stage, as we've seen up to this point, but he set the date too. God determined the date to be a year from then, almost a year from then, right? The Bible says, The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33. God is the one who determines the toss of a coin, the roll of the dice, and the casting of lots. Nothing escapes Jehovah's absolute predestination. Nothing. Now consider the Roman Catholic tyrants. They too are notoriously superstitious. And they have often set the dates of their massacres upon special holy days. For example, the terrible massacre of the French Huguenots, where about 75,000 women and men and children were all murdered for simply being Bible believers. This was carried out on St. Bartholomew's Day. That's when the Catholics chose to massacre them. It's the day picked by the Jesuits. The event is still called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Upon hearing the news of the massacre, the Pope celebrated the murdering of these men, women, and children by having hymns sung, te duums, if you want them, the name of them, and a special coin struck to commemorate the moment. He wanted to remember it. He's an evil man. Well, when Haman reported to the king, King Ahasuerus, he crafted his report in such a way as to dehumanize the Hebrew people. Haman did not call them Jews. He didn't tell the king that. But he merely said that there was a certain people who were causing trouble. By doing this, Haman hoped to cast the Hebrew people in such a light that they simply didn't matter. They're so unimportant, they don't even have to be identified. It's an old Jesuit trick. It's an old political trick. Haman deliberately misrepresents the Hebrew people by emphasizing how different their laws are. Then, by asserting that they don't even obey the king's laws. That's not true. That was an equivocation. 
Like a Jesuit priest trained in casuistry, that's what that's called, Haman whispers lies into the ears of an uninformed king in hopes of accomplishing some selfish goal. Such equivocation and crafty speech has always been the enemy of Bible-believing Christians. If you look at the old Reformed Confession, which is titled the Irish Articles, it's called the Irish Articles, written by Archbishop Usher. And the Irish Articles was one of the largest influences on the Westminster Confession of Faith, by the way. Archbishop Usher, who was forbidden to be at the Westminster Assembly, by the king. He wrote the Irish Articles, and in the 67th article, he states, the popish doctrine of equivocation and mental reservation is ungodly and tendeth plainly to the subversion of all human society. It's ungodly to say one thing, yet mean another. Or to tell somebody something and you know that they understand you to mean one thing, and you don't tell them that you really mean something else, and so when whatever happens occurs, and they want to know, well, I thought you said this, you say, oh, that's not what I meant. <laughs> that's evil. That's casuistry. That's called equivocation. The Jesuits were masters of that. Anyways, the extermination of so many people from an empire, it isn't cheap. It actually takes quite a bit of money to massacre people. And it costs the government money to wipe out an entire group of people because they lose work. They lose the labor force. That has to be replaced. Somebody has to pay for this. So Haman offers to pay the king 10,000 talents of silver to get the job done. That is a lot of money. I don't know how that would translate today, but that's a lot of money back then. Okay. Uh, but don't think Haman is going to go into debt while he murders the Jews. For he has constructed a plan to steal the wealth of the Jews after he kills them. He plans on profiting from their destruction. Remember, Haman wants to take the spoil of them for a prey. So he's going to murder them, and he's going to take everything they own. When the Roman Catholic dictator, Adolf Hitler, murdered six and a half million Jews in World War II, he took their money and possessions for a spoil as well. They got their money. Further back, during the 15th century, the Roman Catholic Spanish Inquisition also gathered the spoils and the land of the Muslims and the Jews that they murdered on the Iberian Peninsula. This is just simply typical behavior of tyrants and their massacres. They kill the people, they take the land, they take the money. You make a profit off of it. You get control and domination. King Ahasuerus had so much confidence in Haman that he gave him his ring for a royal seal, approving his request. The king also gave the 10,000 talents of silver back to Haman. He didn't accept it. He gave it back to him. This further shows his favor of Haman. Not one crime had actually been charged upon the Jews. Nevertheless, the king blindly trusted in this one wicked advisor. These people were going to be killed, and they never even had one charge laid against them. They this, this vague claim that they break the king's laws. They never had a chance to meet their accuser. They didn't have habeas corpus. They didn't have any of the rights that you have in the country today under the Bill of Rights. And you have any of this. You don't have that under a dictator. It was just too bad. There was no trial. They were just condemned. This is why habeas corpus, this is why our Bill of Rights is important. Because if you don't have the type of government that our Calvinist fathers created, 
This is what you got to look forward to. Just be thrown away in some prison or just be killed at the whim of a king. This is why the English fought the first civil war in the 1640s against Charles I. Because they didn't think Charles I had the right to simply throw someone in prison whenever he didn't like what they said or did. This is why they passed the, the right to petition. This is why Oliver Cromwell opposed the king in the 17th century. Haman wasted no time in using the king's right of the king's seal to officially seal the letters that he had drawn up calling for the destruction of the Jews. The letters calling for the destruction of the Hebrew people were sent out all over the king's provinces. All the people of the Persian Empire would know long ahead of time that the Jewish people were to be exterminated in a single day. Everybody had plenty of time to know what was going to happen. Part 4. The Bible says... The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. The post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shishan the palace. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city Shishan was perplexed. So the command to destroy the Hebrew people was published throughout the empire. Since there were many languages spoken throughout the empire, the letters were written out according to all the different languages. Haman wanted to be sure that everyone understood what was going to be done to the Hebrew people. They probably had many enemies besides Haman. This gives them the opportunity to take part in this. And the people did understand that the Hebrew people were going to be destroyed, but they did not understand the reason why there was really no reason given. Just some vague claim that they didn't obey the king's laws. For the people of the royal city were said to be perplexed. They understood they were going to be killed. But they were confused. Why? They could not understand why these Hebrew people deserved to die. Perhaps they wondered if anyone could be safe under such a government. you got to wonder. If just suddenly these people have been chosen to be killed, maybe you're next. Or maybe you'll be next. Who's safe in such a government? Nobody. Regardless, the king and Haman were not perplexed. But they sat down to drink. Strong drink is often used to help a person forget or to cope with a condemning conscience. A nation is certainly in a bad way when its leaders care more for strong drink than they do for some of its inhabitants. A nation whose leaders do not care for the Word of God is also in a bad way. The United States seems to have many politicians of this kind today. But returning to Esther, the people understood the command sealed by the king. They were published in their own language. The people just didn't understand the reasoning behind them. So they, were so they were perplexed. Let us now talk a little bit about Haman's determination to publish his evil decree in the many languages of the people. It is a powerful truth that if something is important and if it should be understood by as many people as possible, then it should not simply be kept in one language. But it should be translated into as many different languages as possible. This is why it was so important to translate the Bible into the language of the common people during the Protestant Reformation. The Pope had kept the Bible from the people by keeping them illiterate and by only having the Bible available in Latin. Only in Latin. During the Reformation, Frederick the Wise had Martin Luther captured by his own knights and in prison for his own safety at Wartburg Castle. This would protect Luther from the Edict of Worms, which, was, which gave any common person the right to kill Luther. See, after the Diet of Worms, they told Luther to recant. He was under a safe pass of conduct. He said, I ain't recanting. Here I stand. They let him go home. 
But on May 29, they passed the Edict of Worms where Charles V, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, permitted any common person who catches Luther, because he was an enemy of the state and the church, to kill him. They could kill him if they got a hold of him. They wouldn't be punished for murder. So Frederick the Wise had him put away in his castle so he could protect him. While under Frederick's protection, Luther worked hard to translate the Bible into German so the people could be ready in the day of their reckoning. Luther was ready in the day of his reckoning. He was well trained in the scriptures. So when he stood at the Diet of Worms, that was the day of his reckoning. And it was only because he was well trained in the Bible he was able to do that. So when he gets into the castle, he translates the Bible into German so that the people could be ready in their day of reckoning. You all have your day of reckoning. It may come to a whole bunch of people at once, or it may come to you individually whenever the Lord chooses. It may come on your deathbed. You know the old saying, dying time is truth time. But the day of reckoning is coming. And the only way to be ready is to have the Bible and to have it mastered. you got to know your Bible. Well, also, William Tyndale, some of you may know it, Thomas More was hunting him. Why was Tyndale being hunted? He was trying to put the Bible in English. And the Roman Catholic, we, uh, the Roman Catholic Thomas More was going to hunt him down and kill him. William Tyndale traveled to Wittenberg, Germany, where Luther was, and he translated the, the New Testament into English. So his fellow Englishmen would also be ready in their day of reckoning. And their day of reckoning came rather soon with Bloody Mary. She put them to death. You got to be ready. King Ahasuerus enabled Haman to publish his evil news and decrees amongst the people and in their own language. Now as Christians, we too are expected to publish God's news to those around us. Even the world. We are to tell the people the bad news. What is the bad news? The bad news is that all men are mere sinners transgressors of God's holy law, condemned by their sin to death and deserving of eternal punishment in the lake of fire. If poor sinners come under the terror and conviction of the law of God, then we are to publish the good news unto them, the gospel. What is the good news? The good news is that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, perfect God and perfect man, came to earth. He lived the perfect life of obedience in our place. He took our sins upon himself by imputation. Suffered for our sins. Endured the punishment for our sins by shedding his own precious blood on the cross. The very wrath of God, Christ propitiated for us, dying in our stead, being buried in our place rising gloriously and victoriously the third day, and all according to the Scriptures. So by the death of Christ alone, we have complete forgiveness from all our sins. And only by the imputed righteousness of Christ, received by faith alone, we obtain a right, a title unto eternal life, heaven itself. We become the adopted sons of God. The gospel is good news to sinners. For it does not condemn us. But it forgives us and it comforts our souls. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for using your holy law to teach us that we are sinners in desperate need of your forgiveness and mercy. Lord, thank you for the gospel. 
which alone saves us from our sins and preserves us from destruction. Lord, we are so grateful that though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we are not afraid, for you are with us to protect us, to preserve us, and to comfort us. Father, we give you great thanks for your word. We rejoice over your Bible. Give us a mind that desires to study your word. Give us a great love of scripture, for it is your mind revealed to man. Send your Holy Spirit to cause us to study it, to understand it, and to believe it. Lord Jesus, be with those who could not be here today. Bless them, Lord. Grant us great strength and courage to teach your word to those around us, to obey your commands, to glorify your name, your precious name, a name worth living for and a name worth dying for. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.